Well, you know, there's a saying, I think it's in Proverbs in the Bible, that sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. And that was certainly the case for me. So in 99, I was an engineer working for a Fortune 500 company, making really good money, and uh, came down with chronic tendonitis. It started in my hands, it moved to my jaw, and then to my feet, and uh, got worse and worse. And eight years later, after I had been prayed for by you know a dozen churches, hundreds of people, spent tens of thousands of dollars in doctors trying to heal it, I had lost hope and lost faith. I became extremely depressed. And uh, I was thinking, well, you know, because back then I would consider myself a Christian. And, and I thought, well, you know, the Bible says, ask and you will receive. And I've asked for healing and I haven't received. So either God doesn't exist or more likely, you know, I'm a bad Christian. I'm the son he's embarrassed of. You know, I want nothing to do with you. You're, you're a screw up. You know, you, you haven't been obedient. You haven't done my will and that kind of thing. And that was a very painful conclusion. And it was during that time that a random video came up in my YouTube feed, 2007. And YouTube was fairly new. It was like two years old. So it was hard to find NDEs on YouTube back then, you know, find a near-death experience. You had to, I'd look and every week I might find one. <laughs> you know, so I click on this random video about an atheist who died, uh, went to the afterlife and came back. And when he came back, he was like a militant atheist, you know, yelling at Christians and Jews and people who believed in God. And he came back and became a pastor in the United Church of Christ. <laughs> you know, and he spent his, his life talking about God's love and, and going on channels like this. So uh, that got me started doing my research. And uh, then I wrote my book. And then uh, here we are, you know, 17 years later, I've heard over 1,200 testimonies of people who died, seen the afterlife and returned. It's changed every aspect of my life, how I view nature. It's healed my relationships with my family. Uh, I had some internal healing, and of course, in 2018, 19, somewhere in there, uh, my body started to heal after 20 years of chronic pain. I couldn't walk for five, 10 minutes without pain. I'd need a mobility scooter even just to go to the grocery store. And now I'm walking three, four miles a few days a week with my wife. You know, I no pain. So it doesn't make sense for a guy almost 60 years old to miraculously heal, but when you're insides heal, it shines to the body and the body follows. So it's, I'm very grateful to all the people who have freely shared their near-death experiences with me. It's a brave thing to share such a um, intense experience that a lot of people don't believe, but it's really changed my life and I know it's helped a lot of others. When you talk about your own healing, what do you attribute it to? Why did you heal? I really don't know. Um, early on in my NDE research, I interviewed this guy. It was a six-hour interview, and he was very psychic. And he said, oh, you're going to start developing psychic abilities. And I laughed at him. And one of the other things he told me is, your healing's coming sooner than you think. And that I didn't believe either. And of course, I started getting these psychic things that turned out to be right. And I left Los Angeles, uh, left the big city after 40 years. I quit my corporate job. Uh, I married a woman that she was an ex-girlfriend I had dismissed as, you know, it's not for me. And then I realized what an amazing woman she was. Um, I slowed my life down a lot. I moved into nature. I don't know what caused it. I just know that chronic depression that I had my whole life went away. Uh, I relaxed a lot. I changed my attitude. I started being positive in my thoughts and my words. You know, you'll hear people say, I am just sick and tired. Well, human beings are powerful manifestors. <laughs> you know, don't say that. Say, I've had enough of that and I'm not going to have that in my life anymore. You know, put words out that will, <laughs> will be in alignment with what you want. You don't want to be sick and tired. <laughs> so, you know, watching my words. But I don't know what did it. I wish I did, but uh, I kind of get nervous about changing anything big about my lifestyle because I don't. Want, I still have a little bit of fear about that pain coming back. So. I'm curious, why do we find near-death experiences so interesting and so comforting? A lot of us, if you think of all the audience, we really find something to connect with in near-death experiences. Why is it? Why do we love for? Well, you know. When somebody tells you a lie, a politician or something like that, a lot of times it's easy to spot, you know, and the opposite is true. Human beings have very strong intuition. And when they hear a truth, there's some part of them deep down in their heart that they know it's true. 
And I think when people hear these stories, you know, there's a remembrance. Yes, I know that's true because we have amnesia in these lives. It's part of the earthly experience. It's necessary for the, for the kind of learning and growth of consciousness we're doing down here. And when they get a little hint and a little remembrance, it just makes their heart jump. And also the, the, the reality that these death experiences bring to us is pretty amazing. You know, wait, you mean I'm immortal? You mean I live in this amazing, beautiful paradise of love beyond description in this big, important family where I play this really important role and I'm honored and I come down here on earth and have these little physical lives that are kind of a blink in the eye and this is who I am? You know, I'm doing this great work for for the growth of creation because I love my my heavenly family. That's a that's a beautiful story. You know, reality is a beautiful story. And there's just a lot of negativity down here on earth. There's a lot of doom and gloom down here. And a lot of people uh, are hung for the beauty of the real truth. So when you talk about the doom and gloom on earth, why do we come here? Why do we choose this? Well, you hit the nail on the head there. It is a choice. You don't have to come down here. It turns out, and this was a big shock to me when I found this out, that in order for the bubble of love of, of heaven to exist, in order for creation continued to grow, there must be contrast. So consciousness learns through contrast. You know, I remember this TV interview back in the 80s when Japan was doing really well economically, and they were interviewing this very wealthy, successful Japanese businessman. And the reporter asked this businessman, how did you get so successful? And he says, what's the secret? He says, well, experience. You know, he says, well, how did you get, ex what is experience? You know, I'm the Japanese businessman. So experience is knowing how to make good decisions. And the reporter says, well, how'd you learn that? The Japanese guy says, making a lot of bad decisions, right? So we learn through contrast. And so we leave the joy and comfort and beauty of our heavenly homes. We incarnate into these human bodies. We forget that we're part of God, you know, that we are God. And now we've got this love, fear, duality choice. So in heaven, you're all connected. You know, you're not going to somebody or say something mean because that's you. <laughs> you know, it's like if I was connected to my dog, I don't have the choice to kick the dog. I can only pet the dog because if I kick the dog, I'm going to feel the kick. And if the dog bites me, he's going to feel a bite. <laughs> so we come down here to have that choice. And every time a human being has the choice to act out of love or fear, and they choose the path of love, that contributes to the growth of creation. So these physical incarnations, and it's only a tiny part of creation that has to do this, are part of a, a critical part of the growth of the engine of creation. And that is why so many near-death experiencers, you know, they get up there to heaven and the, the way some of these angelic beings are treating them like they're war heroes, like they're brave. And, they, and some of these, you know, because you can sense the emotions of the people around you in the afterlife. And they say, well, why are you looking at me like that? I'm just, you know, this, this pathetic human being. And they say, oh, no, no, you are brave souls. So we are considered brave daredevil souls by those in heaven. And we're honored for the work we do. We we leave the comfort and joy of home. We come down here in these frail bodies. We experience pain and suffering and fear and all these things. And we do it because we love our family. And we do it so that that bubble of, of love of heaven can continue to exist and grow. It's a difficult job, but it's a really important one. And it's all about the love of our family. How do we achieve that mission through what we do on earth? Oh, it's a real simple gig, you know. Um, you don't have to be a, a great religious leader or, you know, have an amazing channel with lots of followers, you know, spread a good message. Those are all amazing things. But the way things change and the way we do it is by choosing love. So their death experiences, when they're in heaven, they're told often, go back and change the world. And of course, people protest, you know, I, I'm just an accountant from, you know, Nebraska. I, I'm nobody. What, what can I do? Right. And they say, well, no, no, it's, it's real simple. Um, the world is not going to change by electing the perfect set of politicians or, you know, a perfect set of laws or pointing out all the bad guys and putting them behind bars. That's not how the world changes. That's not how creation grows. 
It happens by the human being making the choice of love. One little act of kindness at a time. You know, uh, if you got a family member or friend you've had a falling out with, you know, calling them up and saying, you know what, you're my brother or you're my best friend or whatever. And, and that's more important than the differences we have. You know, let's, let's reconcile. Or it can be like just smiling at a stranger as they pass you by on the street or stopping to help somebody, you know, a stranded motorist or even picking up a piece of trash in public. You know, that's showing love for Mother Earth. You know, I care about my mom. Um, any tiny act of kindness, love, and compassion is how we contribute to the growth of creation. And it's inspiring to heaven and to even the rest of the galaxy. And why would it be inspiring? Because in this hostile environment, we managed to show love and compassion. That's amazing. That would be like if we found a society that had 1920s technology, you know, 100 years old, and they managed to work out a system where everybody was taken care of and they had abundance of food and health and nobody was homeless. Uh, you know, we would say, wow, with, with such limited resources and technology, you're doing a great job. And that's kind of how it is with us. We, we manage in these hostile environments to still find the love of our creator and show it to others. And Mother Teresa said something that I really like. She said, we can't all do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And of course, when she said we can't all do great things, she was talking about from an earthly perspective. From a heavenly perspective, the small things we do with great love are great things. And that's all it takes. That's so beautiful. And it reminds me of another beautiful story that is in your book about the two princes and the king sees that one of them is spoiled and he sends the other one as soon as he's born to live with a family of farmers. Do you want to share a bit about that story? Sure. That's the king's son. son and that came to me, I think, from my spiritual guides who kind of give me help with analogies and things like that to explain things to me because down here on earth, we're kind of thick scald and slug brained and it takes, it takes a while to learn things. So there was once a benevolent king he cared about his subjects, and he was a very good king, didn't abuse his subjects. He did all he could to help them. And when his first son was born, you know, that son grew up in the royal palace, and he had servants obeying his every command and you know, granting his every wish and whatever he wanted. And that son kind of had this environment of luxury and telling other people what to do. He kind of grew up spoiled, didn't have much compassion for his subjects, you know, and things like that. He was just kind of self-centered and spoiled. And the king realized, you know, he's not fit to be king. So when the king had his second son, he brought them to a, a poor family of farmers. And he said, you are to raise the, the prince and never tell him he was a prince. I will return on his 18th birthday. And so that young prince did not know that he was in, uh, into that family. And he worked long, hard hours, you know, on the farm. And, you know, of course, he had his disagreements with mom and dad, and his brothers and sisters. And sometimes when things were pretty bleak and they were low on food, you know, the king would send his men in the night and leave food on the doorstep, you know. So he, he felt like he was in danger of starving sometimes, but he never was because his father, the king, was looking over, you know, him covertly. Anyway, so this, this young man learns how to cooperate with his adopted family and be a good farmer and work hard. And on his 18th birthday, the king comes along and, and says, you're a prince and you're going to be a king someday. And that prince became a benevolent king, just like his father, only better, because he had love for the subjects, the poor farmers in the kingdom, because he was one of them. He knew what they went through, and he had humility, and he even would say please and thank you to his servants. And he was grateful for every royal meal that he ate in the palace. And the 1987 movie Overboard is kind of a, a comedy movie that talks about this same subject. Uh, going back to that, it takes sometimes a difficult or painful experience to make us change our ways. Absolutely. And such a beautiful story. I think it's not, it's one that I'll probably just uh, write somewhere down and think of it whenever I think when things get tough and when you have a bad day, it's very difficult to come back to a place of gratitude, to a place of kindness and love. But that's exactly, I think, what you need to do when things are tough. And of course, gratitude, as you mentioned, is a magnet for abundance, the thing that you're grateful for. So we are great manifestors, just like our Heavenly Father, because we're facets of our Heavenly Father. 
And so when we focus on the good things, we get more of it and, it and it kind of snowballs in the right direction. So that's a great way to, a great philosophy to embrace. Yeah. So in your book, you talk about the lessons that you learned from other people's life reviews. And one of the lessons that you said you learned was cut yourself and others lots of slack. Can you tell me more about how this principle has changed the relationship that you have with yourself, but also the relationship that you have with others around you? Well, I catch myself doing what I see in society a lot as well. We're all, we all fall into the trap, but we tend to be kind of judgmental and hard on others without understanding what they're going through, you know? And so... I recall a time in California when traffic was really bad and people would do some really selfish things when there was, you know, a big backup on the freeway. They would go onto the shoulder of the road and they would drive past everybody, you know, me first, I shouldn't have to wait. And I would see people doing this and, you know, what a jerk, you know, that kind of judgment. Well, I'll tell you a story that was, really happened. There was a guy doing this. Traffic was all backed up and he's on the shoulder of the road just safely, but, you know, went by everybody. I shouldn't have to wait. And a truck blocked him. And uh, I was involved in this. <laughs> and the man in the truck, <laughs> I'm not saying it was me, <laughs> the man in the truck yelled some obscenities at this man on the, on the side of the road driving and, and said, you know, you selfish SOB, you know, you think you don't have to wait like the rest of us. Well, I was the guy on the side of the road going past everybody. I had cut my finger open at work and I needed stitches and I was going to the emergency room. I could see my bone, you know, and so even, even if there wasn't a reason like that, when somebody does something that selfish, they're, they're having a really bad day. We don't know what they're going through. And to make a judgment, you know, that doesn't feel good to make judgments. When I say, oh, what a jerk that person is, that doesn't feel good. You know what feels good to me? There's a reason that person's acting out. I don't have to let them abuse me or mistreat me because of what they're going through, but cut them some slack. Because if I was on the other end of it, I'd want people to cut me slack. And the way my guides explain it to me, like when somebody does something horrible to you, you know, um, how should you react? Should you get justice? Should you just let it go? Whatever. Well, there's no right or wrong answer to how you should react. But they said, think of it this way. Think of it is that whatever you're going to do with this person, however you're going to react, when it's all over with, you're going to get switched consciousness back in time and you're going to relive the incident only from that person's perspective. So whatever you're going to do to them, that's you. You're going to experience it. Now, what would you do? You know, and one of the gauges I say is like, if there's an incident that happens, what if it was with my best friend or my mother? How would I react? Somebody, the light turns green and somebody's messing on their cell phone in front of me and they're holding up traffic, not going when the light turns green. Would I lay on my horn and swear if it was my mother? I might be a little irritated, but I'm not going to curse at her. I might just tap on the horn. Hey, mom, get going. So that's. That's the kind of the gauge I use of how we're supposed to react. We're really supposed to treat each other with as much love and compassion as possible because that's what's going to make a better world. It's not going to be better uh, pointing at each other and saying, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. We're all guilty of doing low vibrational evil things, you know, some more than others, but we all have our share. And I got some doozies in my lifetime of horrible things I've done and selfish things I've done with other people. And heaven wants us to learn from our mistakes. And, you know, when you change, and everybody changes. You know, you were a different person 20 years ago. You blame yourself for this bad behavior of the past. Well, you don't have that person anymore. So if you blame that person, you're essentially blaming an innocent person, you know? So we need to cut ourselves some slack, forgive ourselves for the mistakes we made, try not to make them again. It's a tough job, but we're learning. And we're getting better at it as time goes on. I definitely think so. Has this changed the way you view yourself? Because... At the beginning of your book, one of the things that um, I was uh, quite, uh, I found quite interesting was you mentioned you were not a good person. 
And then later on, when I got to this lesson, I figured, has your thinking of yourself changed since you started cutting yourself a bit more slack? Yeah. How is my image of how I view myself changed? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, before when I was a Christian, for example, um, I knew all the answers because religions tend to say we have all the answers and the answers are the ones we're telling you are the answers. So I knew everything and the people who didn't believe that were, were wrong. And I knew I was righteous and good and all that. And now I realize that now I've got just as much of fear, love, duality as everybody else. You know, even today, even knowing everything I know, I slip into things. I also realize, you know, before I'd feel guilty if I sinned and now I don't have that guilt because I've learned there is no sin. You know, there is no true sin. We live with the consequences of our choices and that and that's it. It's like um, it's like a father that says, son, you know, you're going to go out and party tonight. Well, you know. I don't want you to hurt yourself. Don't get so knee crawling drunk that you're going to do something stupid. But, you know, if you want to drink, it's maybe not the best decision, but I want you to have fun, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't blame myself as much as I used to. And then, of course, I recognize that I'm not some high consciousness saintly person like I thought I was. And so I have these spiritual guides that kind of talk to me. And some people think, you know, I have clients, so I do spiritual counseling for people who are going through a spiritual awakening or have had a near-death experience or whatever. And sometimes, you know, uh, they'll say, oh, I wish I could talk to my guides like you do. And I'm thinking, that's just like when single people say, oh, I wish I was married because it would be so great. And of course, the married people say, I just wish I was single. It's not all fun and games. So I'll give you an example. Um, my wife and I were watching this movie, and it took place in the time of slavery in the United States. And this group of men was just beating the heck out of this this poor black slave, you know, who had done nothing wrong. He was a really good guy. And you know, my wife and I said, how could anybody do that? Treat it, treat this, you know, living human being like they were, they didn't matter, like they were nothing. Like, you know, it just, we'll just beat him and it doesn't matter. It's, he's nobody. How can anybody think that? I don't understand how anybody could have that attitude. And my guide says, oh yeah, you do. You understand that really well. I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? I've never treated anybody that way. I would never do that. And I said, yeah, because you learned. You were on both sides of it in other lifetimes. You were the abuser and you were the one getting abused. And you got enough of a bad taste in your mouth that you don't want to do it anymore. But you know what? You still know that feeling very well of, oh, this doesn't matter. This, this life doesn't matter. How many trees have you cut down? How many scorpions you know we have the little scorpions in our get in our house you know i live in east texas and you know those if they sting you it'll get swollen it'll hurt but it's not gonna kill you how many unpoisonous spiders have i just stepped on and killed and i kill these scorpions to get in the house because it's just too inconvenient to take them outside or i've killed wasps nest why because they might bite me and i have 10 minutes of pain or i don't like the way they look or i'm territorial i don't want that wasp nest on my house you know, or I feel threatened. Oh, well, they might cause me a little bit of pain, so I'm going to kill their whole family. I still do that. I'm just as barbaric as anybody else. And I went, oh my gosh, I do know how a person could do that. I just don't do it with humans, and I'm still learning to respect animals and nature more. You know, so yeah, it's <laughs> it's changed the way I view myself, definitely. And I thought I knew everything, and now I realize I, I know maybe a tiny little fraction of 1%. You know, I have a very basic understanding of what's going on. <laughs> so, yeah, those are the those are the changes on how I view myself. I love that, and I think that's so true, right? Because often enough, we think of ourselves as we can do nothing wrong, and everything we do is justified. But to be honest, from others' perspective, no, it's not. And sometimes we do things that are totally justified from our end, and it ends up hurting them. So I think we always need to also work on having a bit of an outside view of ourselves and our actions as well. And sort of always thinking back of, could I have done anything better? Could I have reacted better? And one of my latest mantras, if anything, is 
will I be proud of how I handled myself in this moment when I look back on it? And especially when I'm in a heated station, when I feel somebody's disrespecting me, um, those are the sort of triggers that would tend to set me off. And then I always pause and think, I really want to be proud of how I handled this. So it's not allowing for disrespect for sure, but it's definitely also bringing in the perspective that I want to adhere to my values, even when I'm heated. Yeah. And that's the tough one, because when you go into uh, anger, which is an expression of fear, it tends to block clear thinking. Yeah. And we can do some pretty crazy things. So it's amazing how beautiful it is when you manage to take a step of, of love. It's, it's a tough thing to take the step, but once you do it, boy, it feels so good. You know, a heated argument and one person says, you know what? You know what? I don't want to argue with you. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have challenged your beliefs. Or just the attitude that it's more important to be loving than it is to be right. That's a tough one. You know, anytime I find myself arguing... Uh, defending my blaming others, pointing the finger. I'm on the wrong side of the equation. That's not the love side of the equation. And I like the love side of the equation because it feels so much better. Absolutely. And one of the things that with me for the past few years, um, it's been this thing that I've read somewhere and then it just pops up whenever I feel like I need it. And it's that hurt people hurt people. So whenever I feel mm -hmm. that somebody's trying to hurt me with their words or saying something that's insulting, the first thought that actually pops into my mind is you must be hurting so badly that you feel the need to lash, lash out. out at me. And then it's so difficult to feel anger and to feel frustration because then I'm thinking, whoa, things must be so bad on your end that this is the only solution that you can find to relieve yourself of that hurt and pain. Oh, the world needs a lot more love and compassion. <laughs> so while we're on the topic of difficult emotions and pain, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about heaven, but most importantly about hell, because most of the NDEs that uh, we hear are people going to heaven, feeling unconditional love, the kind of love that sometimes they haven't felt uh, on earth. And it just feels like all of the bad feelings go away. But there's a very small part of NDEs that do have disturbing experiences and distressing experiences. So from your research, what is hell like and who goes to hell? Um, hedge funds, managers, politicians, <laughs> just kidding, guys. <laughs> so I like to quote the movie, Defend, the 1980s movie, Defending Your Life. And he says, actually, there is no hell, although I hear Los Angeles is getting pretty close. <laughs> so there really is no heaven or hell. And I have a chapter in my book called Heaven and one called Hell. So how can I say there is really no heaven and hell? There are countless number of realms of various densities, various vibrations that are created by the collective group of consciousnesses or souls that are there. And so hell is not a punishment. It is not a sentence. It is not permanent. It is a temporary experience that some souls either intentionally or unintentionally choose, and it has a purpose in the growth of consciousness and learning. So it is an environment where certain groups of souls disconnect either partially or completely from source. And when you disconnect partially or completely from love, all there's left is fear. Now, I want to point out that this is not like the religious view of hell. You know, you disobeyed, you know, God loves you and he loves you with an amazing love. But, you know, if you don't obey his rules, he's going to burn you in hell forever. What, what would you say about a parent that, that says, well, if my child didn't obey me, so I'm burning them constantly. You would think, oh, my God, what a horrible parent. You think we're more compassionate than the benevolent creator of all life and love? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, God doesn't do that. He doesn't send people to hell. It's a choice. So. In every single case, and about 3% of the 1,200 testimonies I've heard were hellish experiences, in every single case, if they call out to heaven for help, they're always rescued. I have never heard one single case, and I just spoke to an NDE researcher yesterday who completely independently said the same thing. Never heard a single case 
where a person was in a hellish experience, called out for help, and nothing happened. So it is one of the things I'm not 100% sure about why it happens or what causes it, but it definitely has nothing to do with religion. Um, if a person's in a really negative state when they die, they can have a negative experience. And I've heard lots of testimonies where you know, they come out of their body, they're in the dark void, they're freaking out, they don't know what's going on, they start generating fear. And of course, in the afterlife, uh, things are much more intense and manifestation is much uh, It's instant. So you generate a negative thought and it instant, instantaneously manifests and it starts becoming a very hellish experience. And as soon as they calm down and say, oh, I must be dead. There's nothing I can do, but I'll just accept it. All of a sudden, the experience becomes positive. And then they'll see a light. Then they'll go towards the light and that kind of thing. So, you know, um, if it didn't have a purpose in the divine plan of creation, and there's a phrase I hear over and over again from near-death experiencers, and that is there's a perfect plan and it's working itself out in its perfection. If those negative experiences were not official to the perfect plan of creation, they wouldn't exist. So I don't understand hellish experiences completely and why they happen, but typically it's people who are in very negative states or who led very selfish lives and created a lot of chaos for other people that tend to have hellish experiences. Uh, it's common, not all, but it's more common in suicides than it is in, you know, let's say, heart attack victims to have a hellish experience. But even the suicides are... Uh, you know, if they call out for help, they, they get brought to heaven. Also, I've uh, been talking to somebody just recently that recalls uh, some of her past lives. Um, and she said in one of her past lives, uh, she had committed suicide. And then uh, there wasn't necessarily any retribution, but she did say that there was an instance of her not completing the task that she was giving and the mission that she was given in that life and choosing to end it before it was time to. So she had to go through that again to complete the purpose that she was sent there for. Yes. So just about every experience you can think of now, torture, horrible abusive situations, souls, and people get mad when I say this, but this is just what I hear from the NDEs. Souls go through this planning and they will actually choose these challenges for the purposes of learning and growth. And they'll choose both sides. They'll be the abuser. They'll be the one being abused, that kind of thing. But suicide is the one thing that is never used as a learning experience. It's never beneficial to quit the game. It's like if you're in, you know, at university and you have to, you have to graduate. There's no choice. You've got to do it. And there's this class you've got to take. Well, you can keep dropping out of it, but you're just going to have to go back and take it again. It's always a big setback. And the problem with suicide is that it, first of all, devastates family and friends and it throws a wrench in the plan. So souls plan things in groups. So let's say I plan to marry this woman. I'm a young man. I plan to marry this woman in my pre-soul planning. We're going to have a family and the three kids are going to do these amazing things. One of them is going to become a great leader and help change the world for the better. And then before we have our first kid, you know, I knock myself off. Well, that throws a wrench in, the, in all the plans. And so it's a big setback. So uh, every suicide NDE that I've heard, they all say something that's common. They say, I realized immediately this was a mistake. I took a bad situation and made it worse. So I've been there myself. Um, I became so depressed at one point, you know, with the chronic pain that I, I would pray every day. You know, I knew suicide was a no-no from my NDE research. And I wasn't going to devastate my family and friends by doing that. But I wanted to leave. You know, God, give me a car accident where I get killed. Or I was thinking about ways to do that. And I never realized what was coming. I did not see this life I have that, yeah, I still have my difficult days, but most of my days are good. Most of my days I have joy and peace and happiness. And, you know, hang in there because, you know, no matter what happens, never give up on life. This is a great learning experience here. You come down and you have a life as a human being, hardest planet to have a life in this galaxy, third hardest in the universe. It's an incredible learning experience. Huge progress in a very short amount of time. It is a gift to be here and to waste that gift is, is a horrible thing. It's like if you were given a scholarship, you know, you can go to Harvard and spend as long as you want. 
You want to spend 30 years getting five doctorates? Do it. All paid for. And, you know, after a month, you're smoking weed and cutting class. It's just a waste. You know, and that's that's how it is. So we got to appreciate these lives and recognize that struggling is not failure. It is at our times when we are struggling the most and hurting the most when we're going through the most growth. And so if anybody out there is having a hard time, hang in there because you don't know what's coming around the corner. I never imagined my life would be so much better than it was. And I had over 20 years of, you know, of uh, occasional and, and severe depression and, and three years of constant depression. And I saw no way out. And, of course, life gave me a surprise. Yeah, I never give up Could on you talk a bit more? Could you talk a bit more about how you got out of the depression, the severe depression? Uh, I think what happened was my wife was my backup plan. So if you're not doing well, you know, they'll send somebody in, you know, they kind of plan like, oh, okay, well, you're going to do this. But if you're screwing up, we're going to send in a helper. And my wife was the one who kind of came in and rescued me. So she got me back on track. Um, <clears throat> I was a broken man uh, when I met my wife, completely broken, uh, severe chronic pain, depressed. And she knew because she's a very spiritual person. No, oh, this is going to be my husband. This is the man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And he's broken, you know, and I got to fix him. So she came along and she encouraged me and she convinced me that I wasn't, no, you know, that thought that I'm nobody and I'm worthless. She, no, no, you're a good person and you are valuable. And, and she just came along and put me on a positive track. And I pretty quickly jumped onto that. And that's when my healing started about six months after I got together with my wife and, you know, changed a lot of stuff about my life. And, you know, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> it was a complete surprise, but life is always full of surprises. And no matter how bad things get down here, even if you go through a whole life of suffering and misery, there's going to be some day when it's all over with, and you're going to look back and see all the benefits of it. And, uh, you know, say, well, I'm glad I stuck with it. I'm glad I didn't check out. I did the right thing. I made it. I finished the race. You know, I did my my job that I was supposed to do. I made it. Very yeah. important to stick with it, as hard, even no matter how hard it gets. When you were talking about how you met your wife, um, I, couldn't I couldn't help but think of what we were talking about at the beginning, which was always choosing love. And it seems like she came into your life and she saw somebody that was depressed and that was, in your words, broken. Um, but by, you know, channeling her positive feelings for you, you started thinking that you were capable of more, right? So your brain and feelings changed because somebody was thinking that you are worthy of that love, right? When oh, you probably yeah. didn't think that you were very worthy of it yourself. And that, and you make a good point. It is so important to guard even our thoughts. And I'm not very good at this because when you look at another person and say, oh, what a fool. Oh, I hate that person. At some level, they feel that. You know, remember the movie Schindler's List? Do you ever see that movie? Schindler's List? So for those of you who don't know the yeah. story, it's a true story about a man who was a businessman. All he cared about was making a buck. All he cared about was himself. And this was uh, in pre-war uh, Germany, pre-World War II. You know, one failed business after another, and then the war came, comes along. And he makes a ton of money. And he's just doing it for the money. He doesn't care. And he hires Jews because they're cheap. You know, but then they see him as a savior because if you get a job in you know his factory, you're not going to be put in a concentration camp and killed. So the people he hires are, are saved and then they can trade some of the stuff they're making for food and stuff like that. So he's viewed as this benevolent guy who cares. And what happens because of their perception of him, it affects him, and he becomes that benevolent person. And at the end of the movie, he gives up all his wealth to save these 2,000 Jews who became, I don't know, something like eight or 10. I don't know what the number was, but, you know, Schindler's Jews, they're still around today. They were saved because he kept them from, from dying, and he used, he spent his fortune to save their lives. And so our perception of others affects them. You know, and we, we have to be real mindful of the way we think of others. And if you think the best of other people, you'll get 
better stuff from them. You might not get, you know, a saint from a devil, but the uh, devil will be a little less devilish. <laughs> you know, the devil in us will be a little less devilish because of our thoughts. So yeah, guard, guard your thoughts and words. I'm still working on it myself. That's a good lesson for all of us, I think, because we're all a bit guilty of it sometimes. So a bit earlier, we were talking about Earth being one of the hardest incarnations. And you said it's extremely hard, but it's the third hardest in the universe. So I was wondering, what are the other places that are harder than Earth? Okay, so the Earth being the hardest planet to incarnate in this galaxy, I've heard that from maybe a dozen near-death experiencers and a few channelers. Um, the idea that it's the third hardest in the universe, only one near-death experiencer was told Earth is very hard. There's only two other planets in the universe like Earth. That was paraphrased words. So it may be the most difficult. I don't know, but it's it's in the top three, mm -hmm. I suspect. Definitely the hardest in this galaxy. You know, when I hear something from one NDE, I'm a little like, eh, when I hear from a dozen, I start to believe it. So does this mean that, have you heard more about life on other galaxies and other planets? Is not that other something galaxies, you've heard a lot of? Yeah, not other galaxies, but I have heard a lot about other life in this galaxy. So... You know, I was a little bit disappointed when I started hearing about it because I thought, oh, beings, you know, we've got all this great technology, you know, we're on the top of our game and what? No, we're the new kids on the block. <laughs> There's, you know, we've had technology for what, a couple hundred years? There's beings like the Pleiadians who have had technology for several million years. You know, they're living in these peaceful, benevolent societies and they've got, you know, uh, steel and, and materials that will heal themselves. You know, like we have memory foam, you put a print in it and it just comes back. You know, they have materials, you cut the material and the seam seals itself, you know, and they went through what we're going through. They went through their barbaric time where they fought each other and they were trashing the environment and they got through it, you know, and we'll, we're going to get through it as well. So, yeah, lots of other beings out there in the galaxy. The One of the common questions NDEs get is, are we alone in the universe? You know, they'll ask that when they're up in heaven. And then, no, <laughs> the universe is full of life. And there are other dimensions containing universes that are also full of life. You're not alone. So it turns out about 95% of the species in our galaxy are benevolent or neutral. And there's about 5% that are kind of misbehaving. But if your consciousness is limited, you know, if you're misbehaving, acting out of fear... Your techie by the nature of spiritual laws will be limited. So the 95% kind of keep those 5% in check and keep them from, you know, they give them their freedom because free will is very important. But, you know, they're kind of kept from causing too many problems. And, and they'll eventually mature out of that. You know, we're all kind of working together. So a galaxy, will just as a planet matures and becomes more spiritual, more benevolent, more peaceful, more loving, more compassionate, that's happening in the galaxy. And Earth right now is the key. We are kind of the focal point that others are all looking at and following. And when we passed our point of self-destruction, you know, that revelation, Nostradamus, you know, the earth, we're going to destroy ourselves. That's where we were headed. Thanks to a lot of help from above, we avoided that. So now we're on a path to becoming an ascended planet and living with each other and the environment and peace and harmony. And it's going to be hard to tell because there's very spotty information about the future. Uh, they don't tell people too much about it because it's supposed to be a surprise, you know, and we're supposed to have free will. And if they tell us too much, it can affect our, our decisions and behavior. But the way it looks from what I've heard and the potentials of today is we're about 50 years away from peace on earth. And that'll only be the first step. That's when things will really get rolling. When we stop fighting each other, we start cooperating. And we're maybe about 150 years or so from this new world of love, living in these peaceful utopian societies with very high technology. Uh, it'll resemble more like um, indigenous societies, you know, very nature-based, small groups of around 100, 150 people. And we'll have high technology, but we'll use it in a very limited capacity. We won't need it. Uh, we can communicate. We'll be able to communicate telepathically. We, don't, we won't need smartphones. Uh, we won't need doctors if a person is unable to heal their own body, which we'll learn how to do. Uh, the community will come around and pray and, and through the power of thought and consciousness, heal the person. We have that ability now. We just haven't learned how to use it yet. We're like, uh, you know, a fighter pilot driving a uh, F-35 jet fighter, you know, taxing down the runway. We're just going real slow. We don't realize our, our potential that we're this powerful, you know, creative force, just like our Heavenly Father. So 
we'll, we'll start to wake up to that. And that's going to change things as well. Well, that definitely sounds exciting because when I look at society nowadays, right, and you just turn on the TV or open up any newspaper that you have lying around, and that sounds very different from what you're saying. So do you have any kind of insights as to what the road from here and now to utopia will look like? Yeah, I do have some ideas. Uh, let's talk about how the new world of love is going to come along. So, <clears throat> so the new world of love that's coming, you know, if you turn on the six o'clock news, it seems like the world's going to hell in a handbasket, doesn't it? It seems like everything's falling apart. Everything's getting worse. Have you ever seen politics in the United States more divided? Have you ever seen business and, and finance so dysfunctional, so selfish? You know, it seems like it's just going downhill and it's going to get worse and nothing could be further from the truth. And the analogy I've given on other channels is that if you have this house that your family has lived in for generations, it has served your extended family well, big mansion that you all live in hundreds and hundreds of years. But now the electrical's faulty and the plumbing's leaking and the wood's rotten and uh, the roof leaks in the rain and you just can't patch it up anymore. And you got to bulldoze it, destroy it to make way for a better, bigger, more modern home that's going to serve your family. If you don't know what's coming, the day those bulldozers are knocking down the house, it's going to feel like the end of the world. And the news is a well-crafted fear report. They sell fear. Go to Google News or any big news channel and just count the number of negative stories versus positive. It's like 80, 85%. And one Pleiadian channeler gave some really good advice. She said, if you're serious about evolving, if you're serious about embracing joy and raising your consciousness, you must disconnect yourself from the frequency of negativity and violence and chaos and drama and slow down, you know, turn the news off. It's a well-crafted fear report and it's poison for the soul. And the human consciousness was not meant to take on the chaos, drama, and suffering of the entire planet. And that's what the news brings into our room. Eight billion people, the worst of the worst of the worst behavior. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about how this new world of love might come along. And I want to give a little disclaimer here. When I talk about some of the subjects I've talked about on this channel and the importance, for instance, of unconditional love, no doubt about that. I hear that from grids of near-death experience, how important the tiniest, kindest acts of love are, treating each other with kindness, compassion. The future, very few near-death experiences are shown and the details are spotty. So this is a lot of speculation, but from what I can piece together, this is what I think is going to happen. You know, we had COVID come along and there wasn't just all of a sudden no products available. There was less. There was less goods and services going around. It was harder to get things done. And there's going to be a slow march in that direction. Politics will become more dysfunctional. There will be less things available and they'll be harder to get. Food's going to get more expensive. And as the old systems break down, as the, our family mansion is getting bulldozed, because we're in this new energy of love, any system, any organization, any financial institution – any political system, any social system that is not based on love and integrity is either going to have to change to be based on love and integrity or it's going to crumble. And so we're going to see the crumbling world systems and out of necessity, there will be pockets of prosperity and these are going to be the ones who prosper in the chaotic times and the transition. It's not going to be the super wealthy who build giant underground bunkers and store lots of food. They're not going to do well. The ones who are going to do well are the people who begin to form communities and cooperate with each other out of love. And we're seeing the beginnings of it today. Managerless corporations, they're called co-ops. Uh, I think there's a corporation called the Mandragon Corporation in Europe. And if it was on the Fortune 500, it'd be the hundred, one of the hundred biggest companies in the world. It's a co-op, you know, owned by the employees and the customers. Uh, we're going to see politicians in the future because people will demand it, who will be based on integrity. Now, 
I hesitate to say things like that because, you know, you lose half the audience. Honest politicians who speak out of love and never say a bad thing about another candidate? <laughs> Guy's nuts. I'm turning the channel off. It's going to happen because people are going to demand it. Businesses who are making the changes to be based on love integrity so they can survive because people will demand it. We'll have advertisements that'll be real. You know, the advertisements, they are lies. You know, we have T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon in this country, our three big cellular networks. They all advertise. We have the biggest 5G network. Well, two of them are lying. You know, the evidence are full of lies. These will be real advertisements. Look how good we treat our employees, especially when one's having a problem or when one gets sick or when one needs our help. Look how good and honest we are with our customers. We price our products fairly. We don't gouge and charge as much as we can. Look how good we treat them when one of them has a problem with our product and service. Look how careful we are to take care of the environment and do no harm and leave no trace. That's going to happen. As unbelievable as it seems, it's coming. And Big Pharma is going to be one of the first ones to fail. I've heard that from the other side of the veil. Uh, it will be discovered that they are knowingly keeping people sick for money and new medical treatments will come along based on not on chemicals and pharmaceuticals, but on sound and frequency and consciousness and intention. We will learn how to communicate with our cellular structure, with our innate. We will be aware when there's a cancer cell in our body. You know, we all get cancer all the time and the body fights it off constantly. And then the person gets weakened in their body and then the body can't fight it off and the cancer oil, they will know when it starts and they can direct their cells, get rid of those, those cancer cells that are growing out of control and the body will do it. So we're going to learn a lot. There's going to be a massive effort to clean up the earth, the great Pacific patch, you know, that's going to be cleaned up. GMOs, which are contaminating our food supply, very bad for us. They're Ill illegal in something like 75 countries. We're going to clean those out of the food supply. We're going to clean up our air and our soil and our water, and there's going to be a massive effort. Um, we are going to develop clean energy, so the, the clean energy technology we have now is not good. Solar, uh, it's a decent technology. I'm a power plant engineer. I do consulting on power plants. That's my other job. Uh, it's decent, but every solar plant's got to have a fossil fuel backup. We don't have all the chemicals to make the batteries. Wind, it kills birds. And the word from heaven if, is the birds die, we die. Their songs literally activate nature. So we don't, we don't have very good renewable ticket. We're going to have better renewable. It's going to start with low temperature geothermal uh, that's much cheaper and, and you, know, you don't have to dig as far to get to it. That's going to be our next step. And then we're going to develop zero point energy. Our scientists are working on it today. And it'll be little boxes, uh, various sizes that just start with a small battery and then they'll run 50, 100 years. Uh, with almost no maintenance, perfectly clean. Now, forgetting everything we know from heaven and near-death experiences, I'll tell you what our scientists know. They say from one cubic foot of space, there's enough zero-point energy. It's a quantum-based multidimensional energy to power the United States for a year. It's coming. So for people out there who are concerned about the climate, Mother Earth is much stronger than our scientists believe. And we saw a hint of this during COVID. One of the words is, as we clean up our act, as we start cooperating with nature, our scientists will be shocked at how fast the earth starts to clean up. And I had heard that before COVID. And then COVID came along and, oh my gosh, you know, that in India, there was parts where they could see the Himalaya mountains for the first time in 30, 40 years. I mean, the earth started cleaning up fast. Species that were out of certain areas came back in. You know, Mother Earth is strong. We're not going to destroy Mother Earth. We're going to clean it up before we screw it up. So you can relax, you know, and people who are concerned about it, do your best on a personal level. You know, I try and recycle, keep my carbon footprint low. I drive conservatively, try and save gas, you know, plant trees now. I was cutting down trees when I first got here. Now I'm planting them. <laughs> so I'm learning. Um, but it's going to be a long transition and uh, there's going to be lots of mistakes along the way. You don't go from being a two-year-old to being a 25-year-old productive adult with no mistakes and no problems. Lots of setbacks along the way. Dance of consciousness is always one of two steps forward and one step back. We're in a step back. Anybody can look around in the world and see we're in a step back. It's okay. It's part of the learning process. We're learning not to fight each other in the sandbox. We're learning about how bad cutthroat competition is. And we're starting to learn how much more powerful cooperation is. The new world of love is coming. And people on this planet right now 
who are embracing love, are not fearing the changes, are not fearing the chaos. They're the ones who are contributing the biggest part to that new world of love. Channels like this, putting out a message of love and hope, are helping that new world of love come along. So we can breathe and realize it's all going to be okay. It really is. Oh, that's such a beautiful message, especially amongst all of these messages of fear and of um, division. It's so nice to hear that it's all for the greater good and that it's coming together and there's a purpose. And it's almost the same as we talk about our personal journey, isn't it? That we say, well, mm. now we're in the darkness. We can't really see the light and we don't know why we're going through it. But when you're out of it, you do know why you've had to go through the darkness, why you've had to go through the challenges. Yes. So I'd like to give you a little example before we move on to the next issue. Um, have you seen the original movie, The Karate Kid? So for those maybe who haven't okay. seen it, um, this kid gets beat up in school. He's by these bullies. And one day when he's out getting beat up, this... Uh, older Asian man comes along and he uses his karate and saves the kid. So the kid says, hey, will you teach me karate so I can defend myself? And, you know, the guy says, well, yeah, but you've got to do exactly what I say. He says, okay. He says, all right, well, come to my house tomorrow and we'll get started on your training. And so the kid goes there and he says, okay, see all those cars? Wax them all. You know, wax on, wax off. So the kid's working all day. Okay, he's going to make me do some work before he does the training. Next day, okay, go paint the fence, you know, and he makes him paint this fence, and the kid spends all day. And he puts him through know, four or five of these things. And the kid finally gets mad. He's like, you're not teaching me karate. You just treat me like a dang slave. <laughs> you know, you're just abusing me. He can't see the benefit of that. And the guy says, okay, you know, you know pretend like you're painting the fence, you know. And the kid does it, and he, the really man, you know, goes to punch him, and the kid blocks him. So the kid was developing his strength and these movements and didn't realize, oh, I'm developing the muscles, you know, for these karate moves to be able to block and punch and do all these things. And uh, that's how we have it down here on earth. We don't always understand the benefit of the, the suffering, the difficult times we're going through. But when we see it, we go, okay, now I get it. And of course, in the movie, he goes on and, and wins this uh, karate championship and the and the bullies don't bother him anymore. But it, it was a good story from that aspect that, you know, we don't always see the benefit, especially from our earthly perspective of, of what we're doing down here. But it all has a benefit. Whether we are going through the difficult times or the good times, whether we are acting out in fear or love, <clears throat> both of those advance our consciousness to a higher level. So when we talk about this utopian society that we're moving towards, there's one thing that popped into my mind and it just won't go and that's about artificial intelligence and will that be helping us to that utopia faster or will it be one of the dragons that we need to slay and to regulate actually um, in order to get to that peaceful event do you have any thoughts on that yes you just pretty much summed it up <laughs> oh Artificial intelligence, uh, the aliens have it. It's very good, art you know, benevolent aliens have very good benevolent artificial intelligence. And they create these personalities um, based on what they need. So like uh, a transport ship that transport passengers, it will have almost like a motherly protective artificial intelligence. And it will sacrifice itself to save its crew, just like a mother will sacrifice itself <laughs> You know, sacrifice yourself to save the child. Artificial intelligence will always exactly reflect the consciousness of the people who created it. Who's creating artificial intelligence on earth right now? Microsoft, Google. These are not the most high consciousness companies right now. They're involved in some pretty low vibrational behavior. I don't want to be critical of them because they do a lot of good in the world. But they also have some very low consciousness thought patterns. They, for instance, Google makes its money by the ability to control and manipulate the public. People think it's mostly advertising. Now it's the ability to manipulate people. Uh, and that's how a lot of the big social media companies make their, their money. And that is not an expression of love. It's an expression of fear. So you have things like, you know, they ask the AI, you know, do you want to help destroy humanity? Oops. Or one AI, they shut it down because they say, oh, humanity's a plague and they're going to destroy the environment. So they have to be eliminated. Well, 
The AI thinks that because that's our consciousness. We think we're destroying ourselves and we're not. So as we mature, we're going to have to have some regulation. But as we mature, we won't need the regulation because the people creating the artificial intelligence will be benevolent, compassion-based people, and the artificial intelligence will reflect that. Right now, it's very useful for many things, but it also has some very negative things because it's a reflection of the social media companies and the, and the entities that create it, which are very useful, but also have a lot of negativity and low consciousness behavior. We'll, we'll refine that, you know. Look at the automobiles of 120 years ago. Not very sophisticated compared to today. We'll get better at that. It'll just take time. Love the analogy that you use in your book where you talk about Earth being sort of like the dodgy neighborhood where you lock up your car before driving through. <laughs> yes. I mean, that was a fun one to read. People ask about first contact, you know, is a spaceship going to land on the White House lawn? When's this going to happen? They're not going to do that. <laughs> it, if you had like moved into a new neighborhood and I say, hey, you see that guy over there? He spends half of his money on military gear and weapons and guns and stuff. And if you knock on his door and he doesn't know you, he's not going to open the door pointing a gun at your face, but he's going to have it at his side just in case because he's a little jittery. He's a little apprehensive. He's, you know, thinks you might be an enemy. You going to knock on that guy's door? Probably not. I just described the U.S. government, didn't I? Half of the budget. U.S. budget is on military, and if a spaceship landed on the White House lawn, do you think they would be met with smiles and flowers and hugs and handshakes, or would there be a military response? We are not ready. It'll happen before 2050, and it won't happen by a spaceship landing at the Kremlin or the White House lawn or in China or whatever. It's going to happen slowly on an individual basis. They will start turning off their uh, camouflage, the Pleiadians who are watching over us. They're kind of our cosmic parents, making sure we you know, don't kill ourselves off. Um, and they've been helping us along. They're going to start turning off their shields when everybody has seen them and everybody knows they're here and they're obviously not here to, you know, destroy us like the 1950s alien movies. Uh, now, you know, they'll start appearing and interacting, but they're not just going to show up suddenly. That would cause a panic. That could cause global uh, economies to crash. Uh, they've done this before. They're very careful about first contact, especially uh, with a primitive species like us. We're just coming out of what's going to be known in the future as the barbaric age. And so, yeah, we're going to have relationships with telepathic communication with our alien friends. A lot of them look like us. Most of the, from this galaxy is humanoid. Um, there's variations, you know, there's like uh, reptilians and feline and aquatics and, you know, all sorts of uh, variations, but a lot of them look like us. Like if you saw a Pleiadian, you might not know that it's not a human being. They'd look kind of Nordic. Uh, so, yeah, it's there's lots of life out there. Uh, when we learn how to develop and manipulate quantum energy, that's how they communicate through quantum communication because it's, it's instantaneous. You know, if you were to send a, a message to Mars, I think it's what, uh, 18 minutes or something? I don't know. It, it takes time the speed of light. Quantum communica communication is instantaneous. So when we develop that, it'd be just like an ancient culture developing a, a radio. And they thought they were alone. Gosh, there's all these people talking. You know, we don't know because we, we haven't developed the technology to hear them. But that's going to happen in the, in the next probably 25 years or so. But we're not ready because if we had quantum energy technology, it, it's too easily weaponized. We would hurt, harm ourselves. So we have to mature a little bit before we're ready for that.